So welcome everybody. Um, welcome. Good evening. Good afternoon to everybody that is joining us, uh, whatever you are in the world. We're going to talk today about um, a very special product. Um, so today's virtual office hours is going to be from Unreliable Magic to Good Marketing, insights to learn from interviewing 404 nonprofit leaders. And I'm going to talk about a few housekeeping items. So you can use the chat function to type in your comments. You can ask questions in the Q&A uh, function or as well in the chat. Uh, this event is being recorded and it will be shared via email after this session. So don't worry about that. I want to talk to you about Quad. So Quad is an online community that TechSoup has designed only for nonprofits. Um, you're going to have a peer-to-peer -peer community, you're going to have exclusive events, you're going to have expert technical support, you're going to get to know other nonprofits in your area, you can access the, all the entire text of courses catalog, you're going to have additional discounts and more, um, and you can have 10 members in your organization. So I'm going to plug in in the chat um, in a few minutes um, a link where you can actually join Quad. And we're gonna talk um, on today's agenda. We're gonna talk about some introductions. You're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about magic or marketing. We're gonna um, speak about some lessons about 404 nonprofit leaders. We're gonna uh, know about the good marketing framework. Um, we're gonna talk about what now and how you can apply to Feather. And we're gonna have a Q&A session as well. Alrighty, so I guess you already know a few of us, uh, but here's the customer success team. We have Gerard, our director, Kevin, uh, with probably that you already know. He has done uh, uh, quite a few of these virtual uh, office hours. We have Tamira as well. We have Tony, we have Ashley, we have Jonathan, and we have myself. Um, so my name is Vanessa. I am going to be your host today, and I am the program manager of the digital customer success team. And super excited to be here today. I also have Noah Barnett. Um, who's going to be uh, taking away to talk to you about marketing and about Feather. Noah, take it away. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks to TechSoup and the team. Uh, I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, just a little context on me is I am currently the VP of Marketing at Feather. Feather is the nonprofit marketing platform purpose-built to help you run and report on all of your marketing activities from programs to fundraising. And so bunch of other little things about me. Um, but I'm excited today because I get to talk to you about nonprofit marketing. I started my career in nonprofit marketing and fundraising. I ran uh, growth for an international relief and development nonprofit. And I'm excited to share some of the learnings that I've seen over the last 15 years um, and really get into it. So let's dive in. Before we do, what I would love to do is if you can share in the chat. So if you can see the chat, share with everyone. If you could wave a magic wand, what would you make happen for your nonprofit? If you could wave a magic wand, what would you what would you make happen for your nonprofit? So imagine you went to Hogwarts and you're like flipping magic. What would you do to make your nonprofit better, more efficient, more sustainable? We'll add that to the chat. And make sure you share with everyone when you're putting in the chat. Lynn says we'd be a higher profile in our community. Chris says greater brand recognition, more engagement, expand our intellectual bandwidth, more funding. Liz, I think that's common likely. We'd go out of business because the need went away. Wow, what a powerful statement. We would go out of business because the need went away. Everyone would recognize our name. We would win MP in parliament, more funding and community involvement, more unrestricted funding, enable us to be more financially secure connect with everyone who needed us, more brand awareness, or not our, uh, we aren't a part of our fishbowl, or who aren't a part of our fishbowl, so acquire more donors. David says more volunteers. Christy says consistent funding to be able to meet our community's needs. Jim says more directors. So there's a lot of different things in here. And what I want you to do is make sure you hold on to that truth throughout today's presentation, uh, because we're going to come back to it. We're going to circle back to it. But today I wanna to start here. And you might be asking, why are we starting our conversation today at Best Buy? Um, what is going on in here? What's going on right now in this picture? Just drop it in the chat. If you know, what is going on in this picture? 
Black Friday sale, Chris says. Yep, exactly. Lined up for a special offer, Black Friday, et cetera. Yeah, so the reason I share this photo is because you're absolutely right. There's a bunch of people outside in the mid early hours of the morning waiting in the cold. People have blankets and hoodies and all sorts of things, and they're waiting for Best Buy to open in a few hours. Now, the reason I share this photo is because I saw a similar situation when I was about 15 years old, and I was my mind was blown. And it wasn't blown because I was like, oh, wow, why am I not in that line? Even though I definitely wanted to get in the line. That's how lines work. But I was like, what is this magic that's making someone or a someone's, lots of people, do irrational things? Like, what is this magic that's convincing all of these people to do irrational things? And what I learned as I got into my career and went into school for marketing and then definitely um, began doing marketing, I realized that it wasn't magic. It was actually marketing that created this scenario. So magic, I thought magic was help or making people do irrational things, but it was actually marketing was doing, helping people do, or making people do irrational things or encouraging people to do irrational things. And my naivete mind or whatever, when I went off after college was like, if we can use marketing to convince people to do irrational things, can we use marketing to convince people to do rational things? <laughs> and so the rational thing I did was I went into international relief and development work and I got to meet kids like this kid, Francis, uh, and was able to do development work all over the world and really invest in providing education and housing and clothing and really a safe place uh, for Francis and a bunch of his other uh, friends and community. And I got to see the power of that marketing played throughout our impact as an organization. Marketing was what helped us reach more supporters and to basically build a sustainable funding program for all of our programs around the world. Marketing was what helped us elevate advocacy and the importance of caring for children in the communities that we served. And marketing was actually mission critical in helping us reach families and uh, families impacted by various crises to get them to know about our beneficiary programs that they could be a part of. Again, marketing was mission critical at every step of the process, and we were able to use the power of marketing to mobilize thousands and thousands of people to support and provide opportunities to dream again for kids like Francis and others. And so I saw this in action and I was like, man, if we can use marketing to convince people to do rational things, how do we do this at scale? What does this look like? And I've spent my entire career now really focused on this one problem. How do we use marketing to convince people to do rational things that are going to make our world a better place? And I hope to share some of those insights I've learned and a framework that I've applied that you can use as well to not rely on magic to hit that goal that you set at the beginning, but rather good marketing. And so my journey now has found my way to these individuals because I realized there were other people just like me that cared about elevating the importance of nonprofit marketing and the power of nonprofit marketing. At Feather, we have about 120 of us. Uh, we've built a platform that enables organizations to do good marketing and implement a lot of the framework I'm going to share. But also it's given us the opportunity to work intimately and really close with some world changing organizations. So we have over 1500 nonprofits that use our platform. And so a lot of the lessons of the framework I'm going to share don't just come from my own personal experience as Noah, but rather the experiences of observing and really looking at what makes an organization or how does good marketing look that then mobilizes more people to impact. And so we're gonna share some of that. Now, the challenge I've had in 15 years is that most nonprofits rely on magic to hit their goals, not marketing. And that is unfortunate. And it's for good reason. You know, we <laughs> love Grogu style promises. And sometimes it's not because we don't want to do good marketing or that we don't have a framework to do good marketing. I, a lot of people are like, I want to do good. I just can't. And so we asked 404 nonprofit leaders in our state of nonprofit marketing report that said, what is preventing you from growing? What is preventing you or what is holding you back from impact? Because I wanted to explore, like, why do so many organizations opt out of marketing and rely on magic to hit their goals or to mobilize more people around their organization or to grow support? Why is this? What is it? And the number one response in our survey was we're operating on fumes. The number one response by a huge margin 
was that we're operating on fumes as organizations. If you resonate with this, just put a plus one or a yes or something in the chat. Do you feel like this is holding you back in your organization? It's not a lack of intention to do marketing, to promote our organizations. It's due to the constraints and the, the kind of challenges that we're all dealing with that we just have to opt for hope sometimes and rely on magic, not marketing. And what I hope to do, because we're all navigating this, and some of these challenges are what I call the chaos cloud that we're all, we're all in right now, are things we can't control. They're just the nature of the work we do right now. And it's gotten even more complex because change is now constant. And attention is the most valuable currency. And resourcing for organizations continues to decrease. Now, we can throw up our hands and say, yeah, Noah, you, you're right. You've just made the case as to why we rely on magic over marketing. But what I hope to do by the end of this conversation is to provide a framework that's actually even more effective in the midst of the chaos cloud that helps you organize your activities and focuses in a way that's going to help you rely on magic to hit your goals and not marketing. Because if we continue to just rely on magic, we're leaving our impact up to chance. And so typically in marketing, we either do nothing, we do everything. So we're, we're not, it's not that we're not doing anything. We're just doing everything from TikTok to telethons, to billboards, to broadcast media, to Facebook ads, to email marketing, et cetera. We're just like, if we do enough things, then we can hit our goals. And the third strategy a lot of people opt into, which is that they do ad hoc or what I call the hopscotch strategy is like, oh, we tried this. Oh, now we're going to try this. Now we're going to try this. And regardless of which of these strategies we employ, this is what I mean by unreliable magic, because doing nothing is more hopeful. Doing everything is exhausting and not intentional. And doing kind of the hopscotch strategy is not allowing the benefits of multiple activities um, to really pay off. Now, the alternative is not, is my, my argument for this is that the alternative, which I call good marketing, is, is a better approach or a better response to us operating on fumes because it gives us more intention. It allows us to slow down, focus on what we're focused on, which is our community. It's community first approach. It's responsive. So it doesn't require you to know exactly what to do and when to do it but rather just to open up a conversation with your community through marketing. It's omni-channel versus siloed channels. So it's not just relying on email or just Facebook or digital advertising or events. It's saying, what are the right channels that we should leverage to connect with our community? Again, good marketing is just a more mindful approach to outreach and communications. And again, I'm going to share a framework that walks through this. And last but not least, it's more measurable. And so you know not just, well, we got a bunch of clicks on this ad or we had you know, 35% of people open this email. But good marketing is really grounded this idea of we're doing things that are measurable. We're not falling victim to the 50% of our marketing is working. We just don't know which half. It's rather saying we know what's working because we're measuring it and its impact against our things. This is what good marketing is. And my argument to you today is that Good marketing is actually a better response to the chaos cloud and us operating on fumes than typical marketing or unreliable magic because it's more focused, it's more impactful, and it's actually less exhausting because it has more intention. And so let's get into what, how do we actually make this, my, this transition? How do we move from unreliable magic to good marketing? And we're going to provide a framework that you can use to grow your fundraising and your community that we've developed here at Feather. One thing I will say is that if you have questions throughout today's presentation, feel free to drop that in the Q&A box. That's going to be the best way to isolate the question. If you just want to provide commentary or clarification on the content, use the chat box. Either way, we'll definitely spend a lot of time in Q&A um, after we kind of present the framework and give you an opportunity to respond to that. So what is a framework? Frameworks can be scary. Frameworks can be academic. Frameworks can feel as though, you know, we're going back to like algebra class and we're going to do some formulaic uh, kind of manipulation and all of that. I want to dismiss that. <laughs> and what I love about this slide, so this is my son, Eli. 
And what I love about this slide is it fully embodies why frameworks are helpful. It fully embodies why frameworks are helpful. And here's the point. Eli is intently focused. And so Eli is taking the time to have a plan and to come up with that and really focus in on what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what is, what is that. That's the intention of a framework. The other thing that Eli is doing is he's using a pencil, a Star Wars pencil for that matter. Uh, didn't know that tie into the theme of magic, but here we are using a Star Wars pencil to write this plan. Now, the reason this is important is because a framework should be flexible in the same way a pencil is. So there's this axiom that says, hey, you need to make a plan, but you need to do it in pencil and make sure you bring a pink eraser with you. And that's the power of a framework. And so when I walk through this framework, it's not intended to be some like algebraic equation. It's supposed to center around intention and focus and also flexibility and learning. And so that is the power of a framework. And so let's walk through what we call the good marketing framework right now. And then I'll talk to the application of this for you and your organizations at various uh, challenges. So whether you're trying to acquire new donors, you're trying to cultivate deeper connections with your donors, you're trying to build advocacy and awareness, we're going to apply the framework to each of those scenarios after we walk through it. So the first step in the good marketing framework is to identify who you are trying to connect with. So instead of starting first with what we are going to do, the good marketing framework says you must first identify who you are trying to reach. Now, who you are trying to reach could be your current donor base. So people that have given to you in the last 12 months, you want to cultivate a deeper connection with them. And so you have identified who you want to target, which is the group of people in your community that have given to your organization in the last 12 months. You could also say, I want to reach or connect with individuals in my community that I don't know, but that have an affinity for the work we do. So this is an unknown group of people. So you don't actually know that it's Noah or Vanessa or Shannon or Lynn, but rather it's a group of people that are in the community that have an affinity for your cause. That would be an unknown group of people, but they're still in your community and they're individuals that have an affinity towards your cause. That could be because they've given to like-minded organizations. That could mean they mirror the attributes of your best donors by using things like lookalike audiences. Each of these are a way for you to identify who you want to target. So the first step is who are we trying to target? Who are we trying to engage and connect with? Who are we trying to reach? Once we've identified who, the next thing we need to do is understand what we know about them and what they know about us. Once we've identified who, we need to ask, what do we understand about them and what do they understand about us? The way to do this is to ask two questions. The first is, what interactions or engagement have they had with us in the recent past, if any? So this is you as an organization reflecting about how have they engaged with you in the past? It could be that they've given to your advocacy programs. And that's the unification of this, this group. They're not just donors, but they've given to the advocacy programs and they've supported the advocacy programs you have in the last 12 months. That would be the first question. The second question is almost more important. And the question we skip over is how would this group of people describe their relationship with your organization? How would this group of people to define their relationship with your organization or connection to your organization. This isn't what how you see them as don't you know last 12 month donor advocacy donors, but how would they describe their relationship with you? It could be oh we connected with them at an event and I've loved getting to know their organization in the last 12 months. It could be that they have no idea who you are, right? Like and if they were asked they would they wouldn't know who you are. But if they were asked to, um, if they supported advocacy programs for children in the community, they might say yes. So again, they might not have a connection or describe a relationship with you and your organization, but if it's an awareness group that you're trying to target or trying to engage with, they might just describe their connection to the cause or their affinity towards the cause. Like I'm a Colorado resident that is outdoorsy and I really appreciate the protections of our national parks. 
you might be an organization that is advocating sustainable protections for national parks in Colorado. They don't know who you are, but you would describe that they would have a relationship with the cause. And that would be the context that this group has. So again, just rewinding a little bit is first is who do we want to target? The second question is how would they, the group, describe their relationship or engagement with your organization and or cause? And then the third question is how would you, or what interaction recently or engagement has this group had with you, if any, in the past? So who, how would they describe their relationship? How would you describe their recent engagement with your organization? These three questions are crucial. And you might feel like we don't have time for this. You know, we're a fast moving organization. You just told us, Noah, that we're operating on fumes. Like, why are we going so slow? I would go back to this graphic is that the reason we're asking these questions at the top of the framework is because we want it to provide us intention, which then leads to focus, which actually gets more output per input than we would historically versus focusing on just doing ings we're starting with focusing on the market. It's marketing, not in market. It's marketing, not in market. So we have to start with understanding the market or the group in our community that we are trying to target or we are trying to engage. Now, the next part of this framework is that we want to cultivate a connection with this group of people. We want to cultivate a connection with this group of people. Now, we intentionally don't use like target, convert, attract, convince, interrupt, any of these like typical like war-torn marketing words, because ultimately what you are trying to do is to cultivate connection with this group of your community, whether it's a new community, a new group of people, or it's a very loyal and supportive group of people. You're trying to cultivate connection because unless we cultivate connection with them, we can't actually activate them to action, which is the next step. If we don't cultivate connection, we can't activate to action. I haven't got, I haven't activated someone to make a donation without connecting with them first. And connection just isn't like building rapport and doing all that. It means like they're out in the community, they're scrolling social, they're wandering the web, they're inundated in their inbox. If you don't connect with them in those spaces where they are, they have no bridge back to your organization. The connection is the bridge between your community and your cause. The connection is the bridge between your community and your cause. Now, when I say cultivate connection, and we're going to dig into this further, there's three components of cultivating connection. The first is that you can think of this like a campaign. So you can say, hey, we're going to design a campaign to cultivate connection. And within that campaign, there are two core components. There is the content we are going to use to communicate or to bridge that connection. And then there are the channels we're going to use to facilitate the connection. So within a campaign, you have content and you have channels. The reason this is important is because the content and the channels should be informed by what you understand about the community. If I know that this group of people has an affinity for outdoor protections in, in the environment in Colorado, but they have no context to our relationship, you know, Colorado Conservancy or something, just making up these names for illustration purposes. I then need to ensure that the channels and the content I'm using take that into consideration. So I don't know who they are and they don't know who we are. So email or phone calls might not be the best option because we don't have that level of connection. I don't even know who these people are. But something like digital advertising or affinity targeting or geofencing or intent targeting may be the right channels to use. And then the content we would use would be oriented around their affinity for the cause and then create a bridge back to our organization as someone they can partner with to work on that cause. So again, understand your community, cultivate connections. Cultivating connections requires campaigns. And then within campaigns, there's content and there's channels. Again, we're going to deep dive into this much further as we get in. This is just a primer. Now, once we've cultivated connection with this group of people, now we get to activate them to action. We get to activate them to action. And so this could be a membership sign up. This could be getting them to volunteer. This could be getting them to just sign up for your email list, just to be informed about all the great things uh, that your community or your connected community is being able to have in on this cause area. It could be signing up for a policy change. It could even be signing up to be a beneficiary of your organization. 
you know, we have an organization here at Feather that they don't even use us, use the good marketing framework to raise money, even though they could, but they actually use the same framework to reach beneficiaries of their programs, to encourage individuals to apply for housing assistance. Because again, that's the activation action they're trying to achieve. They're trying to activate people to fill out an application to get housing assistance. And so they're using the same framework for their program outreach as they are for their fundraising or volunteer cultivation outreach. So whatever that activation is, is the next thing. Now, the thing is, is that when we typically design campaigns, we stop here. It's a linear framework. Group of people that we're trying to reach or target or engage, we run a campaign, and then we measure the impact on outputs. How many donations did we get? How many volunteers did we get? What is the outcome? Now, with the good marketing framework, it's not linear. It's a learning framework. And so the other outcome that comes out of every campaign you run is that you also get learnings about the community that you engaged, both those that actually were activated, those that connected with you, also those that didn't even connect with you through the campaign. All of those learnings are now additional information that you can use in your next campaign. So the last part of this is learning what we learned throughout the campaign that we can infuse back into our next campaign that we might run. Now, the last thing I want to say is the good marketing framework is intended at all of the intersections, understand, cultivate, activate, and learn. Every single one of these steps is actually driving more impact for your organization. And what I mean by that is that marketing is not a means to the mission. It's not something we do to achieve the mission or to get people or convince people to do the mission, but it's actually part of the mission. If you're a childhood cancer research organization, you understanding your audience is part of the mission. You cultivating connection with them is part of the mission. You activating them to get involved with advocacy, to sign up for educational learnings, or to actually donate to the organization is part of the mission. And you continuing to learn about how your community is responding is part of the mission. So at every intersection of the framework, we're increasing the impact or good we're having, which is why we call this the good marketing framework. So that was a quick primer on this. We're going to dive into each of the segments more specifically. Again, if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A box. Uh, and I'm going to kind of walk through a, a few examples with you, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So just as a reminder, this framework, the good marketing framework, can be applied at each stage of the engagement funnel. So whether you're trying to reach net new people, whether you're trying to engage your current community, or maybe you're trying to cultivate deeper connections with your most loyal supporters, volunteers, members, you can use the good marketing framework at every stage of this funnel. The framework and the funnel complement each other. They don't compete with each other. The framework and the funnel do not compete against each other. They complement each other. They're two things that come together for you to be able to drive more intentionality and focus and how you use marketing to grow your organization. So let's go through the framework again in detail. First step is identify who, what's their context, what's their intent. Again, every single group of people that you're trying to engage has different context of your organization, and they have different intent or engagement with your organization. And so as we're designing campaigns, we can't start with, we want to drive more donations. So we are going to send emails, and then we are going to send emails to these people. That's working the framework backwards, which only gets you tied in a knot. You have to start with who are we trying to connect with? What do we know about them? What do they know about us? What is the right content and channels we can use? And then how do we activate them to the desired action? It always starts with your audience. Again, what you know about your community drives your campaigns. So these are some example segments or targets that you might use to begin using the good marketing framework. It might be volunteers for you. It might be event attendees. It might be members. It might be website visitors. Maybe you're like, hey, our website gets 1,000 visitors or 100,000 visitors or 20,000 visitors every single month. And we actually only know a small percentage, maybe two, three, four percent of them. But there's all of this engagement, right? Like we get natural PR or people come to our website because they're always trying to learn about the latest um, uh, latest uh, goals or objectives. Uh, this could be a segment that you're saying, hey, we want to engage this audience further. We want to drive this further. 
Uh, Deb put in the chat in the Q&A, isn't there a step zero where you define what you want to accomplish or what success looks like? That's absolutely true, Deb. I think the thing that's important here is that even if our end goal for your organization is drive more donations, what we want to activate someone to do based on what we understand them might not be to give a donation. And so even if that is our end goal, drive more donations, or that's what maybe you are reporting to your boss or we're reporting to the board, is that we still have to go back before we decide what to activate is understanding what we know about this group of people and what is the next right activation on their journey to maybe making a donation. So your activation goal for a campaign using the good marketing framework, maybe for them just to watch a video or to sign up for your email newsletter or to visit your website. There's a lot of different ways that you can program the goal that you're trying to activate people to because that information or that first yes or micro yes is going to enable you to better cultivate them for maybe a donation. So you can actually begin in kind of a more complex version of the framework is create what we call nesting campaigns, where you're basically building campaigns on top of campaigns that feed into each other. So when someone activates through one campaign, they actually get fed into another. And then when they activate in that campaign, they get fed into another. And this is called like nesting good marketing campaigns. Um, for today's call, since we're just doing a primer on this, uh, I'm not going to dig into the nesting function of this and really just focus on how do you actually design using the good marketing framework, a good campaign, and then how does that potentially apply to the various stages of your engagement funnel? But great observation, absolutely. You still need to know what you're after as an organization, but then still the audience and what you understand about them should dictate how you connect with them and then what you activate them to uh, in any given scenario. So back to identify, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. And again, even though we're talking about a lot of different opportunities here, you might just start with one. You might say, hey, like, I want to apply this framework to donors that gave last year but haven't given yet this year. Donors that gave last year that haven't given yet this year. And specifically, I want to target ones that have, uh, have been more digitally inclined. And so we have their email addresses, but they gave last year, but they haven't given this year yet. And that's where we're going to start. It might be different. It might be, hey, we want to target net new audiences or acquire new donors. And so we're going to focus on donors and our, our, our potential donors in our community that have an affinity towards our costs. And that might be your starting point. And again, wherever your starting point is, is going to inform the campaigns. The important thing here is that the good marketing framework is focused on relevancy over reach relevancy over reach. And so it's not just about how do we reach as many people as possible and then get my 3% conversion rate, but rather it's how do we def de design our campaigns to be highly relevant so that the in it increases the likelihood that a higher percentage of the audience will be activated to action, even if that means you're reaching less people, even if that means you're reaching less people. So we've talked about understanding and then um, defining your community. We're going to get into cultivate. Again, cultivation is a campaign where you want to design a campaign and say what content and what channels should we use that's going to best engage this. Content could be, hey, we're going to use this uh, advocacy article that talks about the, the 10 ways that are 10 descriptions about how this policy issue is impacting, you know, community residents. It might be a video showcasing the impact of your work in international programs like we did often at my organization. It could be promoting um, uh, an event that's coming up. That could be the content. Hey, we have this event coming up and that's the content. Channels is going to be other things like email, display ads, social ads, website engagement, marketing automation, et cetera, that you're going to use, phone calls, um, billboards, et cetera, that you're going to use to connect with this audience. And again, certain channels are going to be better for certain groups of your audience. And also different budgets are going to enable you to use certain channels or not use other channels. Again, what you know about your community is going to inform both the content and the channels that you use. So a few different channels that we find really helpful that a lot of our customers at Feather use is that if they're trying to drive awareness, I've mentioned this before, is but they'll use what's called affinity targeting. And so affinity targeting allows you to, to define various attributes about what your best donors or best volunteers look like. And then through that, 
target those individuals or reach those individuals uh, with various advertising types, whether it's on social media or whether it's through display advertising like Grace is doing here. And so as people are wandering the web or scrolling social, they'll actually be able to see and connect with your organization's cause. And again, it's defined by shared attributes or affinities that mirror your best donors, but these are net new people that you don't know. And so you can define this using what's called affinity targeting based on demographics, purchase history, industry affiliation, location, and more. One thing I found interesting is, for example, you can go down to target uh, recent intent purchase or like purchase intent. And so let's say you are going back to our Colorado example, you are someone that um, engages around environmental awareness and protections. You might say that people that shop at outdoors shop at outdoors like REI or Patagonia or Dick's Sporting Goods or even um, uh, some of the other big box sporting goods stores may have a higher affinity or there's a perceived affinity that if you're investing and in enjoying the outdoors, you might be more inclined to have intent to support our cause. You can target down to those intent details like recent in shopping intent history at REI, Patagonia, et cetera. Very, very powerful. Um, the other op opportunity here is smart send email. So instead of just using email marketing to email out to your supporters, um, you can actually use smart email triggers by people that engage with your website or engage with your ads or recently have done something specific. So instead of me saying, hey, I want everyone in this group to receive this email right now, Smart send emails enable you to send emails at the right time to the right person in the right context. And so they could have just seen your ad on Instagram or Facebook. They could have just visited your website. And so then they can get an email in their inbox in relationship to a previous action they took. And that's a really powerful channel. So it's not just email marketing blasting it out, but it's actually smart send emails based on recent engagement. Uh, the other one to mention is retargeting. And so this is a great way to re-engage or to recultivate an audience that you're already connected with. And so if someone's visiting your website or you've spent a lot of effort really promoting, let's say a year end campaign like the IJM had, they want to benefit from that. And so they said, hey, people have been exposed or seen our campaign. When they leave and you know, imagine like your website's like a store, they come into the store. When they leave the store, we wanna continue to remind them of the impact they can have and continue to participate in our programs. And that's what retargeting is. So when they leave your website or store and they go out and they're in their inbox or they're scrolling social or wandering the web, they would still be able to connect and be reminded of this. The most practical way we've seen this, and it's really increased impact, especially at end of year, is retargeting traffic that comes to your donation page, but they don't complete a donation. So this is called like donation page abandonment. Um, or um, sometimes it's called like cart abandonment campaigns, but basically using the channel of retargeting ads to engage the people that visited your donation page, but they didn't complete a donation. So there was intent, that was your audience that you're trying to target, and then you're using both smart emails and retargeting advertising to be able to reach that. So that's the channels you're using, and the content you might use is more of a re-engagement content versus an acquisition content because they've already been exposed to the campaign. A great example of how what you know about your community informs both the content and the channels you use to cultivate connections. Again, community first, not channel-based reporting. So it's not just how did our emails do or how did these ads do or how did this billboard do, but rather we are reaching this group in this campaign. How did our orchestration of activities impact them to not only activate action, donations, volunteers, et cetera, but also what did we learn? So learning and uh, activations are both outcomes. And so we're measuring the impact of that at a community level, not a channel level. And again, this can be applied across the engagement funnel. So last but not least here is activation. Um, so activation is gonna be different on what you're trying to activate someone to do based on the campaign, based on your organization. Um, but it's really about measurement. So one thing I wanted to share is an example from a, a executive director, uh, founder of an organization. She sent me this message and said, hey, Noah, we're talking about you today because I feel like you might know the answer to my question. We have a segment of 3,000 people who have given recently less than $500. So they're beginning to identify using the good marketing framework who they're trying to engage. 
we're thinking of sending a direct mail ask for joining monthly with a corresponding email marketing that matches. So this group has already previously donated. They want to use direct mail and email the channels to invite them to be a part of their monthly giving program. And they're going to use a story. This is detail isn't in the text, but a story about someone that is benefited from the monthly giving program and how others and why others support monthly giving at their organization. Now, this is where the confusion comes in, which is she says, but should we just ask for a one time instead of end of year or since it's end of year? So the assumption is end of year is a time where people give one time gifts in their experience. Or should they ask for monthly? So they really wanted to ask for monthly and activate that, but they're saying, hey, based on what we understand about this segment, should we ask for monthly gift or should we ask for a one-time gift? And the challenge is you don't know. And I said, it depends. And I said, it ultimately depends. I know that's helpful, right? And I went on to describe a bunch of different scenarios and different options that they could begin to test and what might help them, uh, what might help them better uh, make a decision here or they don't make a decision, they actually try both, and then they can use that lear the learnings that they get from the campaign to inform their future campaigns. Again, one thing about activation is it's really about what you're trying to accomplish, what you know about the community, but ultimately it's just about trial and error and being able to test. So there are three types of test that you can use as you're uh, beginning to use the good marketing framework. The first is what's called trying. And a trying test is that you're just testing new things. You have a lack of control to learn, but you're just trying to benchmark results. You know, someone recently uh, put in the chat, hey, what's your thoughts on threads? What, how do you think they should be using that instead of X slash Twitter uh, with all the distractions, right? And it's like, I don't know. For your organization, I'm not sure. I think threads might be a great opportunity. I think X slash Twitter might be a great thing for some organizations. Or if you've never done it, maybe now's the right time. We don't know. So that might be something you want to try. So it's still a test it that you're using. Hey, we want to test this channel, but it's not a pilot or an experiment. It's like, we're just going to try this out and see how it helps us or doesn't help us. That's trying. The second like version or lever le um, level of testing is to do a pilot. And so a pilot is an organized test of new things with a clear hypothesis on the expected results within a predetermined time frame. So for example, you might say, hey, we're going to do retargeting advertising. We're going to try we're going to we've tried retargeting advertising and it began working. You know, we saw some increased conversions than what we saw in the previous month. Now we're going to run a pilot for 3 months during end of year where we're going to invest x amount of dollars and we're going to use these this content this, this channel of retargeting ads on social and display. And we are going to re-engage people that visit our donation page and don't make a donation. And we expect that that will increase our results by 20% year over year. So again, we've defined the pilot, time found. You have a hypothesis on what the results are going to be based on what you've tried and seen in the past or other benchmarks. That's a pilot, right? Like you've never, you don't, you're not A-B testing or doing like this detailed statistical significant analysis, but you're just piloting something with clear expectations, clear bounds, and a hypothesis of the impact. Level three of testing is where most organizations think testing is and then don't do testing is around experiments. And so once you have a successful program or you're running a program that is producing results that you feel like is significant, but you want to optimize or improve that, that's where you can run a level three test, which is an experiment where you're doing variable testing that includes a holdout of the control group to determine if a specific test performs better. This is kind of like what you traditionally think about testing, where it's like, okay, we're going to show the green button instead of the red button. And we're going to compare red button versus green button and see what the impacts are. We're going to have a video on our donation page and we're not going to have a video on our donation page. What is the results? Again, you have a clear anchor to what is true, but you're testing that against in real time, usually in a competitive environment where you're showing one to some people and one to the other. That is more of like your A-B test, A-B experiments. That's a level three type test. But again, the reason I think a lot of individuals and organizations don't do any testing is because they think all tests are level threes. And what I would like to do is free you up and say, no, some are level twos where you're having a pilot. Others are trying, where you're just trying something. 
And this shared language about what level one tests are, level two tests are, level three tests are, enable you also to have shared expectations within your team of, hey, we are looking at this to learn. That's what trying is typically. We're trying to figure out like if this is a good channel for us, if this is good content for us, if this tactic that we heard other organizations are successful with is even beneficial to us. Again, shared language on what the outcomes and the objectives are. With experiments, it's very clear. Like we're running a scientific experiment, A versus B. If B wins, we're going with B. It's not up to qualitative research. It's like B wins, we're going with that. Again, shared language around testing can be super helpful. The other thing I think good marketing individuals do or people that apply the good marketing framework is that we always want to start with the assumption that we're wrong. And our goal is to find out how wrong as quickly as possible. The great thing about being a marketer and being in the environment we live in today is you don't have to be right. And a lot of times you can't figure out if you're right without taking action. And so in that text message example, my final advice to them was like, hey, whatever you choose, you're probably wrong. But your goal is to figure out how wrong as quickly as possible so that you can apply those learnings to your next campaign and continue to improve. So again, good marketing assumes that we're wrong. And our goal is to find out as how wrong as quickly as possible. So again, the good marketing framework is designed to help you provide intention and focus amidst the chaos cloud, give some clarity to that and say, hey, we're focused on this part of our community. We're going to cultivate connection with them and we're going to activate them to this action. And then we might do some nesting of that into other campaigns, but ultimately we're just trying to learn. And so the last part of the framework is learning. And so this is to provide you new context and new intent. The goal you want to do is, is really understand like, is our programs working? Is our people the right things? Our processes right? And really growth is kind of a result of you learning which of these it is. Again, we're going to provide these slides to you if you want to go deeper on this. But growth is a result of our programs, our people, and our processes. And I think our role in learning is figuring out, like, how is this framework applying to our funnel? What is working? What is not? Where are there opportunities to grow? And that's the mindset that good marketers have. We also encourage our customers and even those that are using this framework to use what we call responsive rhythms where you're doing like weekly check-ins. So you're saying, hey, we're going to look at the metrics on Mondays. We're going to do priority huddles around various campaigns. Maybe like I do for, with my team is we do a weekly wrap where we just take a step back and say, hey, what did we learn this week that we didn't know last week that's going to be more helpful or that's going to help us be more successful next week? Just a simple question. What do we want to celebrate this week to close out the week? Because we're always getting better week over week. And then monthly doing retrospectives. Hey, how did this campaign work? How did this test work? Hey, we really had high hopes for this and it really failed or flopped. What happened? What did we learn? Was it a process? Was it a program? Was it just something we learned? Uh, and then doing priority check-ins. Like what are our priorities for this month? What are we focused on? And then quarterly doing a, a broader set of feedback, whether you're doing PPP reviews, which is programs, people, and uh, programs, people, and processes reviews, hey, how are we doing across these three buckets, getting your audience feedback or your community's feedback, and then even doing what I call a pot refactor. This is priorities, obstacles, and targets, and so really refactoring what that should look like for the quarter. Again, this is getting in more to the 201, 301 level of uh, implementing the good marketing framework, but I wanted to provide these as examples for you. Again, the intention of the good marketing framework is to give you the focus and kind of a clarity of thought on having a plan amidst the chaos cloud on how you can do good marketing and rely on that versus relying on uh, unreliable magic. So I want to kick it over back to you, Vanessa. I know we have about 10 minutes left for some Q&A. Um, if you're interested in learning more on how our Feather platform, our, our nonprofit marketing platform can enable you to do good marketing, feel free to reach out to us at feather.co. I'd be happy to chat more with you. Um, I actually just read um yeah, thanks so much. website on the on the chat. So everybody is able to click on there and connect on you guys. Alrighty, we do have a few questions here. Um I have a question here. It says people don't like to receive unwanted mail messages. Um this go often to spend. How do you, how does your organization react uh, to this kind of reaction? Um, so 
people don't receive unwanted mail or messages, they often go and spam. How does your organization redact? Got it. Okay. I found the question because I wanted to read it to make sure I processed mm -hmm. it. So I think that is true for everyone, right? Like we don't want unwanted ma mail. I look at my inbox right now and I have tons and tons of messages that I don't really want to um, answer. And I'm like, why are these people reaching out to me? I think what's interesting is that's typically because it's not only unwanted, but it's not relevant to me. And so one thing that we focus on a lot is like, what is relevant to the community you're trying to reach, especially when you're doing... Uh, acquisition or awareness campaigns. And so again, getting the de definition of who you believe would be one or who you would want to connect with this, not just anyone, allows you to make sure that the content and the channels you're using are relevant. In addition to that, just respecting people's privacies and not buying email lists is a great way to do that as well. And so digital advertising, um, other more like brand centered marketing channels become more effective to use when you are trying to drive awareness and acquisition. Um, those typically do cost money to do, but if you're really targeted and hyper-focused on who you're trying to reach and you're thoughtful on the content and the channels you're using to reach them, that ROI usually pays off in the long run to connect more people in your community to your cause. Um, that's really awesome. Um, I also, um, we have a few questions regarding how this better work. Um, and Davey in particular were, were asking, uh, they are a very small nonprofit, and if they were decide to work with Feather, um, how would that work? Uh, so maybe we can just um, speak yeah. about how can you sign up for Feather and how those maybe those plans work for um, any type of nonprofit, even small or bigger nonprofits out there. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to both parts of the question. So Feather is a marketing, like a nonprofit marketing platform similar to what you would run your email marketing through, or maybe what you would even do natively, like in Meta or on Google and search. We just provide a centralized place for you to organize, run, and report on all of those campaigns. So everything from your you know, weekly email newsletter to your drip campaigns to cultivate new donors to your digital and social advertising. Now with that, we usually are working with organizations over a million dollars in revenue. And so if you're not over a million dollars in revenue, I would you're likely not a best fit for Feather because the complexity of your campaigns aren't such that you would need a centralized marketing tool to be able to facilitate that. And so there are a lot of native tools that you can lean on, like Meta, like Google, or your, you know, what email marketing platform you're using to implement some of these things. Feather just enables you to do that in a more sophisticated way. And again, typically it's an organization that's a little bit more established over a million dollars in revenue is kind of an arbitrary line, um, given that that's when organizations need Feather as a centralized marketing platform. Awesome. Um, some people were asking about um, some integrations uh, with Feather. So uh, someone asked if you guys are doing anything with AI as of right now. Um, so right now, and I think this is maybe my suggestion even beyond what Feather is, is there's a lot of great opportunities with AI. And I think like we even are experimenting it on my own marketing team. However, when it comes to like the fundamentals and foundations of connecting with your community, um, we have not integrated that directly into the tool in a way that's trying to over leverage that. We continue to look at it and continue to see on how AI can actually not do what I think is popularized right now, which is like content creation or like content curation. But how can you actually use AI, which is something we have had in our platform for a while to give smart insights on like how you should connect with your audience or smart reporting on like, what are the pathways that someone's taking to connect with your organization, uh, et cetera. I think some people were asking about um how can they create um, marketing outside of the U.S.? A lot of organizations have um, branches outside of the U.S. or maybe they are, we're, because we're global, we also um, provide services to um, nonprofits outside of the U.S. So like, is it different from uh, a U.S. marketing campaign um, or, or this specific method that uh, Feather um, does can be applied outside of the U.S.? Yeah, I'll be the first to admit I'm not a like global marketing expert. So I know that different laws are different. Um, different laws in different places mean different things. And so I'll just self-admit that. 
I think regardless of what the rules are around in your community, it still comes down to what are the channels that you can use to connect with your audience. And so in some, it might be you can use things like affinity targeting, or you can use things like lookalike audiences like you can do here in the US, or even things like geofencing, where you're saying, hey, I want to target this group of people that live in this area. That's not an option in other places, but there are a set of channels that you can use to connect with your audience. And so it, again, it goes back to within the context that you are operating, you may have certain channels that are available to you or not. It still comes down to what is what do you understand about your community and what channels and content should you use uh, to connect with them? Yes, I think that's very important um, to like know your target. Um, a lot of people were asking about um, emails, like email marketing. Um, and then someone asked, like, how do you get smart email? Yeah, so smart email is a feature within Feather, um, but it really relies on the ability to know who, who's engaging with your website and who's not. And so the key here is that Feather's email marketing tool is connected to our, our website in, engagement tracking. So when if I send an email to a Vanessa and Vanessa came to my website, I would know that Vanessa was the person that came to my website because Feather is being able to identify that that email engagement was associated with the website visit. And so that's where you can then do smart emails where when someone like Vanessa maybe comes back or engages with the website and doesn't take the action we wanted, we can then send another email, which I'm like, hey, Vanessa, I saw that you checked out our video campaign. Like, we're so excited for you to be a part of this campaign again. Do you have any questions? And the relevancy of that's significant because I sent another email that was like, hey, everyone, we launched this big campaign and she clicked on the video and went to watch the video. She watched the video, but then she didn't sign up or take action. I can now send a personalized email and be like, hey, Vanessa, like, we're so excited to have you back in this. Like, it's again, that relevancy of smart email becomes really impactful. And a platform like Feather enables you to do that because you're tracking all of your website digital engagement in one place. That's really cool. Um, and I feel like you can, you can, like you were saying, you can put people on different journeys. Like, um, for example, somebody click on your in, on your email or somebody can watch your video, they maybe uh, the other campaign that you can put them in another journey can be actually checking out something on your website or, or doing a donation. So that's super cool that uh, Feather can allow you to do different journeys at the same time as well with the same person or same organization. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I will just, yeah. if I could comment, yeah. Vanessa, I, I know someone asked about this earlier, is where you start seeing the big, the more powerful aspects of using a platform like Feather for maybe a medium to large organization is mm -hmm. those nesting campaigns. You know, you refer to them as journeys, but it's really your like nesting campaigns together that are always on. So let's say Vanessa comes back and takes action. I've already predetermined the path or what we call flight that I want you to go on now. So it's like you sign up for our email list here's the path that we're now going to take you on. And that's running 24 seven instead of it being just based off of quarterly campaigns or other things. So All right, uh, and someone asked about yeah. Salesforce. We do integrate it with Salesforce. I just wanted to comment on that. Um, oh, yes. do help you replace... I, I don't know if there's anything re related to, um, to uh, website hosting that you guys also um, have any integrations as well. Yeah, so we we integrate with most all website hosts or CMSs. So whether you're using something like WordPress or Wix or something else, um, you can integrate the Feather engagement tracking into those types of websites. And then we typically are integrating with like a CRM or a donor management system like Salesforce or Razor's Edge or Virtuous or some of the other kind of Bloomerang, for example, uh, even association platforms like IMIS. And then we are usually replacing like someone using MailChimp or Constant Contact. They can use Feather for all of their email marketing and all of their other marketing campaigns as well. Sounds wonderful. Well, it was a pleasure having you, Noah. Um, and to everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I have left in the chat um, for you guys to join us in our next virtual office hour in October 31st. We're going to talk about AI power tools in the Microsoft Power Platform. Please register there. Um, I have also left uh, the community, um, the quad community link 
for you guys also to sign up. And as well, I have left there uh, the Feather uh, website. So if you want to talk with Noah again, please make sure that you go to the website and contact them to know more about Feather and how can Feather help out your organization. It was a pleasure again, everybody. See you all again in October 31st. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, TechSoup. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.